Good morning again. Uh, my name is Randy Sherrill. I didn't introduce myself earlier. I'm one of uh, two co-lay uh, leaders here at the church. I'm blessed to be able to do that. What an awesome staff, Britta. What an awesome staff we have here that does such a great job. Yeah. What a great job. Our, our uh, Jonathan and our uh, praise band and everything. What a great Sunday to be here. Uh, let's go to God with the scripture. The scripture this morning is from Malachi chapter 3. Verses 8 through 12. Should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me, but you asked, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? You have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. You are under a curse, for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Then all nations will call you blessed, for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Thanks be to God. This is the word of God for the people of God. All right, good morning. I'm Chris Bryant, senior pastor. Thank you so much for joining us in worship. Everybody here today, thank you so much. It's great to see you. It was raining first thing this morning. I was excited. Uh, the, the message today is, is what to do in a crisis, what to do when it's already raining. It was perfect. It was just pouring. And so the sun, I think, has come out now. I'm a little bit upset about that. But nonetheless, uh, uh, I, I think it's going to be a great day in worship. It already has been. Um, just a really powerful experience. Um, so, uh, you know, as a pastor of 24 years, I know how incredibly important it is that we remember on a semi-regular basis all the biblical truth and wisdom and knowledge there, there is to be gleaned on how to deal with a crisis, financial or otherwise, and specifically with regard to this particular series with finances, to, to learn to, how to prevent it, as we're saying, preparing for the rainy day, to deal with it, to cope with it, to most importantly, get through it. This week on NPR, that is National uh, Public Radio, they released a poll that they had conducted back in July. And the results of that were that 46%, 46% of Americans back in July were reporting, quote, having serious financial problems, end quote. Now, that seems a little high to me, but, but let's, let's say even if it was just half that, it, it, call it 23%. That's still one out of four Americans saying that they're in really big financial problems trouble. The same poll found that one-third of all respondents had used up most, uh, if not all, of their savings, and one in six reported missing or delaying bills, major bills, so they could simply buy food. Now, Robert Blinden, a Harvard uh, professor and pub a public health professor uh, who actually was one who administered the poll, who worked on it, he also says that he was surprised by how high the numbers were, and one of his conclusions was that, that a lot of people may not be Realize, may not uh, uh, realize how, uh, how many programs and assistance that there is out there, that perhaps they're having trouble accessing the help that's available. Well, as your pastor, I don't want you to have trouble accessing the help that's, the, the help that's possible. I, I want you to have the benefit. I want you to have the benefit of, of everything, whether it's governmental assistance and uh, you know, local assistance, but, but certainly spiritual and theological assistance as well. I mean, that's our pr preparing for the rainy day. We're, we're 
coming to a point here in the theme below where let's talk about when it's already raining. What do you do then during a crisis? Now, the practical advice is as straightforward as it is simple. Practically, here's some real basic steps. Okay, and then I'm going to move on to more of the spiritual teaching. But, but just in case somebody is, is watching today or here today that need this, I think this is really important. So uh, number one, the first thing is you got to learn to ask for help. And, and if you're like me, you got used to a few months ago in your inbox for your email, every program, every agency, every business, every, you know, uh, thing that you've ever been involved in in your entire life was sending you an email, if, if you were like me, talking about their COVID-19 plans. I mean, I was getting a slew of email every single day about, oh, we're ready for COVID-19 and this is our plan. And I thought, just quit bothering me. I mean, it was kind of neat at first, but, but then after a while, all that to say, look, if you're in trouble, people have plans. Agencies have plans. Businesses have plans. You need to contact them, whether it's your mortgage or your landlord or your credit card companies, all the way down to utilities. Reach out, ask for help. There are plans in place. As a matter of fact, it was at one point in time, uh, the water company, for example, water, we're, we're told don't shut off anybody's water, even if they don't pay the bill, because we want people to be washing their hands right now, you know? And at that time, uh, it was, you know, it was the lockdown order, it was the shutdown orders, and so people were at home, and, and it may still be that way. Ask, ask for help. Even without a national tragedy, oftentimes you'll find that people want to work with you. Asking for help means relying upon family as well, friends, certainly your church family. I said this last week, I'll say it again. Look, if you need help, reach out to us. We're a church that wants to help folks, including people of the household of faith, our very own. So reach out to us. Okay, the second thing you have to do is prioritize. And, and here, and, and this is one of those things that if everything else was normal and fine, probably we could think through ourselves, this ourselves pretty well. But, but in a time of crisis, it's so hard sometimes to think. In, in a crisis here, the first thing is food. Look, you, you got to eat, okay? And so taking care of just some simple basic groceries, that's the first priority. Here's the second one, your car. Now, that may seem strange to people, but, but here's the thing. You've got to get around. You've got to be able to buy groceries. You've got to go look for a job. You've got to go to a job. Okay, so actually your car comes second. The third is then your housing, mortgage, rent, this sort of thing. Everything else is a distant, distant second. Okay? All right. Third and finally, if you haven't started conserving, welcome to your crash course. Right? And, and what I think about here is the cell phone. Right? The, our cell phones, a lot of us, uh, have a power saving mode. And some of us on our cell phones, it, we have a super power saving mode. And, and we can put it on automatic to where it, when it gets to a down to a certain percent, like 5% or whatever, it kicks into the super power saving mode and, and, and your, your pocket computer becomes nothing more than a phone. Like an, nothing, not, almost nothing on it works because it shuts down just to most minimal, minimal abilities possible to conserve as, as for as long as, as possible. It, it'll work for a phone for a long time in that super power saving mode. And that's what we got to do personally, right? We have, to, we have to figure out what is truly our most basic essentials. And in times of desperation, often we figure out how little we actually need to live on, at least for the short run. Maybe we can't live like that forever, but on the short run, we can now, that's a really rough and broad picture of practical advice, but I think you get the idea. And if you need help, I want you to reach out to the church, not only for immediate or, or, or direct financial assistance, but there are people here that will be willing to talk to you if you need help thinking through these things. So, so here again, ask for help, right? Then the second thing is prioritize your needs. And third is conserve. Don't be embarrassed about this. This church helps people all the time, maybe not every single week, but it's a regular occurrence here. We have people in this church that can walk you through and help you think through things in a time of crisis. Okay, so um, I want to move on now to the theological and spiritual side of things and share with you that there's three ways of dealing with a crisis theologically and spiritually. And I bet everybody in here has had all three perspectives. And in fact, you may fight all three perspectives all the time. And, but, but, but before I do that, I want to share with you why we read our particular passage today. Now, this, this passage from Malachi chapter 3 is, is the biblical basis for the message, of course, but, but it's going to come at it, I think, in a little bit less direct way than what you might have imagined. The text from Malachi uh, is the most familiar passage, I think the most quoted passage when it comes to the idea of tithing. And what a tithe means, it's, it's a transliterated word. You take a, a word from uh, the biblical languages and you just 
change the letters into English, and that's where you get tithe. So it's, it's literally a tenth. It simply means a tenth of or a tithe of. So tithing is the term that we give the practice of giving 10%, of giving a tithe, a tenth of our income, of the harvest, of our possessions, giving it back to God. Now, the first time we read about the tithe in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 14 with Abram or Abraham, but this is before he becomes Abraham. This is what he's called Abram. And Abram uh, is in battle. He actually has to get all of his household together and they actually go towards, uh, uh, he, and he fights these city kings and, and he wins. And so he has the spoils from that battle and he gives 10% of that back to the God because this person, this, this figure, this mysterious person just shows up out of, no, out of nowhere, um, Melchizedek, and is called the, the king of Salom, peace, right? the king of peace, and is also called the, the priest of God most high. And, and, and this person comes and brings bread and wine and presents it to Abram and blesses Abram. Isn't that amazing? It's really interesting. This is the only place in the Bible this person shows up. And Abram's response is to give 10% back to God. Now, Jesus never addresses tithing directly. Uh, in the New Testament, but indirectly Jesus does. It, when he's admonishing the Pharisees, there's at one point where he's really chastising. He says, look, you guys are so serious about the law. You, you even tithe on mint and dill, and like, the, like the herbs. Like, you, see, you, you know, you're extreme tithers. And he says, but you should put, you know, more attention to the weightier matters of the law. That is kindness and, and compassion. And then he says this, you should have done or practiced rather the latter, that is, he's affirming indirectly the practice of tithing. You should practice the latter while not neglecting the former, mercy and compassion. There are 28 other references in the Old Testament to tithing. In the New Testament, there's only seven other references uh, to tithing other than the, what I just referenced there from Jesus. And six of those are all found in the book of Hebrews in one chapter, in chapter 7 in Hebrews. And they all refer to that story in Abraham that I just told you about. In Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, we have our scripture reading today. Again, it's probably the most often, often referenced and pointed to passage with regard to tithing, giving 10%. And with it comes two startling, two startling phrases. The first is that God accuses people, God's people, of robbing him by not bringing in the full tithe. That is the full 10%, as well as special offerings as well. That, that, that's in there as well. The second is that we find that this is the only place in the Bible where God says it's okay to test them. Test me now on this. God challenges us. If you bring in the whole tithe, will I not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out blessings that overflow? Now, over the years, I've learned different ways to invite and encourage people and, when appropriate, challenge people to tithe. And over the years, I've been blessed to see a number of people grow to become tithers, from either not giving anything at all to jumping to tithe to others that kind of grew into it. And specifically, I've seen folks in the midst of crisis become tithers. If you'd have told me 24 years ago that, the, in fact, the, the greatest motivation in my ministry for folks to become tithers would have been, well, just have them go bankrupt or lose a job. You know, 24 years ago, I said, I don't, that just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But that has been my experience. I'd say about half, maybe not quite half, but almost half of all the people that I know in my ministry that became tithers, giving 10%, Almost half of them did so, began so, because they lost their job, they were on the edge of bankruptcy, or they were going through some sort of financial crisis at the time, and their response was to become tithers. Now, I don't know how that stacks up to people in general. I've never seen any kind of data to support it. Maybe my experience is unique. Regardless, I, 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 over the years, I've learned um, to, well, I ha this is the first time I've talked about it in this regard, because that's, that's not how I became a tither. Well, you know, when I was young and I started making money as a teenager, I just gave 10%. That's my story. And, and so responding in a time of crisis and, and tithing, I don't relate to that. But, but every time it has happened and I've seen it, I've been amazed by the people who have done it, by their experience, by their decision, and certainly by the results that come after the fact. I'll tell you, one of the things I've learned is that uh, all of them that chose to tithe in the midst of a crisis all of them did it out of a sense of faith and gratefulness, not fear. Not fear. They weren't afraid. They weren't afraid of God. They weren't afraid to be punished. They weren't, 
they, they make a move of faith and gratefulness and decide to give the tithe. Tithing, giving 10%, became an activation point. And this is the real point. This is the real message center right here. If you get this, you don't have to listen to anything else I say, although I hope you do. Tithing, giving 10%, became an activation point where something changed inside of them, their heart, their mind, whatever, it changed inside of them. It didn't come from me. It didn't come from outside. It was happening inside of them. Something changed and about how they thought about their faith, how they felt about their faith. And the way they were then, from that point on, determined to live their life, whether they were in a crisis or not. Now, I, I wrote this sentence this week, and, and this is one of these sentences that I'm going to keep. I'm going to add to my lexicon or phrases. Because o- over the years, there's a number of things that, that, that I've kind of coined or come up with based on experience that that are just so concise and yet are really true to the experience I've had in in the spiritual truth. This is one of them. Like if I could summarize all the testimonies that I've heard from from these people that I'm thinking about right now who became tithers during a a time of financial crisis, this would be the summary. Of of all their variances and differences and distinctions, the truth is all of them, the the act of that was I, I, I... uh, activation point where something was going on with their faith and their heart and their mind. And they had determined at that point that they were going to live differently, whether they were in a crisis or not. You know, when we go through a crisis, we tend to find ourselves in one of three perspectives. And the first perspective is I'm all on my own. And, and you don't necessarily have to be um, a non-believer to have this perspective. In fact, I think a lot of religious people, nonetheless, have this perspective. I find that my, my life, oftentimes, I vacillate back and forth between trusting God, inviting and invoking God's help and guidance in my life, and the other side, a- a- approaching life as if God doesn't even exist. I mean, it's not that I don't believe God exists, it's just that's how I'm approaching it. It's how I'm living. It's how I'm engaging I think anybody that has ever tried to truly be responsible, at least on occasion, struggles with this balance. You know, trying to nonetheless be responsible but invite God, and yet not go so far as to do things totally, solely out on our own strength. The way I was raised, the way I grew up, for the majority of my life, I felt the joy and also the burden of responsibility And being responsible and dependable and working hard, being a leader, these are great things. These are good characteristics. But sometimes we just take it too far. Sometimes we forget about God. Sometimes we put all the burden, the entirety of the burden for whatever result we're looking for upon our own shoulders. So you don't have to be an unbeliever to have the perspective of I'm all on my own. Especially during a time of crisis. In a time of crisis, sometimes that's where we default to. You know, normally we're very spiritual or religious or whatever, but then when the pressure comes on or something really bad happens, sometimes just by default, we we kind of check back into that. I've got to do this. It's on me completely. Not that we don't believe in God anymore. It's just that's how we're interacting. Now, of course, those who don't have faith, this is the way they are. From by, by default, you know, they may or may not rely upon friends or family, but, but giving up on faith or, or never having faith to begin from, from uh, at the beginning means that they, they are giving up on anything greater than themselves helping, you know, they're, they're giving up on any sense of a higher power. It's interesting to think about what are we gaining when we choose not to involve God? What are we gaining by giving up on God, especially in a crisis? Do we gain anything? Or are we, in fact, losing something by having a I'm on my own attitude? Now, other people, they develop or adopt a different perspective. It's an adversarial relationship with God. Their attitude and perspective is God is doing this to me. Or or sometimes it's framed like this. Why is God doing this to me? And, And these are very highly religious and spiritual people. But see, all the spiritual energy, all the emotional energy is directed to a competing at odds relationship kind of dynamic going on with God. Most of the time, this perspective comes from a kind of faith that people grew up with, a faith training from their church of origin or or maybe that's their faith tradition that they're currently in. And, and it's a position that I disagree with. As a Methodist, I believe in free will. Further, I believe in God's sovereignty in such a way that it doesn't violate my free will. In other words, I do not believe that everything happens for a reason. 
I do not believe that we are all puppets on a string. I do not believe that every single causation in life, whether it's someone as tragic as as someone getting cancer or as kind of benign as just getting a closer parking lot spot at the grocery store. No, I I don't think that's necessarily how God works. Not all the time, at least, you know. But if you do, if you tend to think more towards that hyper sense of God's involvement in the world, it becomes a struggle. And people who, have, who think like this tend to, especially in a crisis, find that they're in conflict with God. On the one hand, they want God and they know they need God, but on the other hand, they're in tension with God's role in their life. Now, don't get me wrong, everybody gets mad at God at times. Everybody does. And you're allowed to be mad. And some people, I think, based on their, their situation, it's even more justified that they're angry with God, at least on an emotional level. And God is big enough to handle all that. God is big enough to handle our anger. But what's really important is that we work through it. It's important that we we work through it and we come to that place where we have that third perspective. And the third perspective is that God is our friend. God is our friend. God is our guardian. God is our good shepherd. God is our great physician. And in this perspective, pain and tragedy is just part of life. Frailty of our own bodies It's understood as how things just are in this broken world and our broken lives. This perspective sees God as coming alongside us and being with us in the midst of the tragic, in the midst of a crisis. This view does not see God as the cause of what is wrong, but the savior of what is wrong. God knows how badly things can turn out in this world. God knows how awful we can be to each other, even at times torturing and killing each other. God knows the frailty of our bodies. And sometimes how things just go wrong there, whether we're 50 years old or whether we're in fifth grade, like one of Kara's students who went to get a haircut and they found a lump on his his top of his head and found that he was in fourth stage leukemia. Now he's doing better, but that's the brokenness of life. The third perspective sees God as our help in a time of need like that. This perspective sees God as one who interacts with us, who who expects us to do our part. Yes, like bring in the full tithe, for example. Even as God promises to do his, I'll rebuke the devourer for you, as one translation puts it, and, and pour out blessings that overflow. Which, of course, at the time must have meant that God uh, was going to protect the agricultural crops from pests and insects and perhaps molds and fungus, and, and the blessings meant a good harvest, a good crop. But what would it mean today? What is the devourer today that God might protect us from it? Is it our own worst impulses? Is it loan sharks? The repo man? I don't know, maybe. Early in my adult life, I will tell you this, two different utility companies when, when money was at the worst and the tightest in my life, two different utility companies on two consecutive months, instead of a bill, issued us a credit. How does that happen? It happened to me. It's the only time it's ever happened in my life, but it happened. Most of the time, I think rebuking the devourer has more to do with rebuking our worst impulses. But on occasion, maybe it is something else. And the blessings that overflow part, I don't think it works like investments, not the way I call my financial advisor, who, if you're listening, I'm glad you're listening, Paris. Uh, But, you know, it doesn't work like that, right? It's a little bit, but I do feel blessed. I'm blessed by my my family and people who love me in my life. I'm blessed by this church. Blessings have come in how I've discovered new ways to save money and and make do or even make better instead of buying new. And uh, blessings have come through, through me just committing to generosity and changing kind of the person that I am based on the person I know I'd be if I wasn't like that, (laughs) or at least the person I can tend to be. When I've seen people become tithers in the midst of terrible financial situations, job losses, bankruptcy, some other kind of financial crisis in court, this sort of thing, it, it has been because they've sought God's protection and they've sought God's blessings. But listen, listen, not out of fear, Every example I can remember, none of them were afraid. And that's part of what sticks out in my mind. They, they seemed so happy to make that decision. And they were proud that they had made it. It represented for them a kind of switch. A switch that was occurring, again, inside their head or maybe inside their heart. Moving from one of those first two perspectives into this third one. Essentially, I would phrase it like this. The third perspective, they were joining God's team. 
They decided to do their part while trusting God to do God's. And the act of tithing, well, that was the faith action that merely, merely represented what was happening in them. Not fear, but faith. They weren't bargaining or trying to manipulate God. They were simply joining up, partnering with God. And as I look back, I don't think any of them were unrealistic about their expectations. I don't remember any of them saying, all right, I'm going to start to tithe and I know God's going to give me my job back. Or I'm going to give 10% of my savings and I'm going to win the lottery now. I mean, I never, none of them had unrealistic expectations. It was more like, though, that they were, they had a, a kind of sober understanding. They had kind of a sober understanding that life is tough and bad things sometimes and sometimes often happen. But in faith and with gratitude, they're going to partner with God to make it through. And in this case, they're partnering with God in this very specific way. They've decided to tithe. And none of them, to the best of my knowledge, ever regretted that decision. You know, we always have one of these three perspectives. Either I'm on my own, or why is God doing this to me? Or I'm on the team. I'm joining up with God's team. And it becomes more obvious to us when we're in a crisis. We always have one of these perspectives. And often in a crisis, what happens is we may think before the crisis that we're actually in that third perspective. We feel like we believe, you know, we're on team, you know, that we're on team God, you know, I'm partnering with God. And then the crisis hits and we realize in that moment, actually, I kind of think I'm on number one. I kind of feel like I'm on my own. Or we find that we're in the second perspective. I'm kind of mad about God, at God for what we're going through. And we have to pause for a second. We have to think, but wait a minute, wait a minute. Is, is, do, did we misunderstand what being on team God meant? Does that mean that we weren't ever going to have a crisis? We weren't ever going to have problems? No, that doesn't make any sense. Let's just think about Jesus. Now, did, did, did Jesus have an easy life? Did he live on easy street? Or was things kind of tough for him? Isn't that an amazing thought? Once in the gospel, Jesus comments to someone who wants to follow after him. He says this, you know, birds of the air have nests and foxes have holes but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. At another point, when, when everybody had decided they'd had enough and they checked out, and we read that many at that point followed him no more, John 6, 66, he turns to his, his disciples and, and, and says, will you also follow me? Or will you also leave me? Or, or think about the way his life, earthly life ended. Was that fair? Did Jesus deserve that? I love how some of the ancient theologians refer to how Jesus had to trust God through his suffering, that they had to, that he had to trust God, that that God wouldn't make it right, that God wouldn't let him suffer for no reason, that at the end, he would be declared as right and and, and truthful because God would let him stay in the grave, but would raise him up and prove to all he was the one that truly was in the right. Or or the Apostle Paul, the person most responsible for our New Testament, second in influence to Christianity, uh, second only to Jesus himself. And yet John read from that scripture today from 2 Corinthians, right? Where Paul goes through this incredible litany about being uh, 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 whipped, you know, and and the lashes, you know, three times or or five times actually. And then beaten with rods three times and stoned and shipwrecked and being out in the open sea. and, And just this litany of all this incredible terrible things. I mean, was Apostle Paul like, hey, I'm one of your apostles. Isn't things going to get better? You know, being with Christ didn't make Paul immune from problems or crisis. We know about that word, don't we? Immune. Being with Christ did not make Paul immune from problems or crisis. And he also did not see things as God is doing this to him. Instead, he embraced that this is a broken world, And our bodies are sometimes frail and things go bad and we can, people can do horrible things to each other and we can even face the consequences of our own actions. All that is really broken. It's not that God has left us or abandoned us or caused it. No, in fact, God is our savior. We partner with God because this is the way life is. God is here to help us and guide us and ultimately in Jesus name, save us. I think Jesus had this perspective clearly as well. So does Paul, and I want us to have it. Not because we think things will be fine and dandy, but because we know, we acknowledge we're going to have problems and trials and tragedy and crisis, and that, we, that that's part of life, the part of the broken nature of, the, of this world. But we choose to partner with the Lord anyway because of those things. 
Will you choose to partner with God? Think about that, that third perspective. I choose to partner with God. How do you do that? How do you join that third perspective? We partner with God through a faith action. We partner and trust God through a faith action. What faith action do you need to do? Not to prove to God, but to prove to you. So again, this is happening inside of your heart, your mind. What faith action do you need to do to move into that third perspective of being on the team, of partnering with God to make it through a crisis, make it through life, make it through all the problems that we face? In times of financial crisis in the past, I've had people decide that for them, that action was to become a tither. They didn't do it out of fear. They weren't pressured. I wasn't even preaching on it at the time. Instead, it was something deeply personal to them, something happening in their own life, something they decided to do because they were thankful to have a Savior, and they wanted to put their full faith and trust in Him. And so they felt at that time, the best way for them to do it is to begin tithing. What about you? Is that where you are today? Or is it something else? What faith action are you being led to take today in order for you to move into that third perspective that you trust and believe in God and are partnering with God to get through this? What is it? I believe many people right now, if you just listen, the Spirit will speak to you, the Spirit will nudge you and guide you, whether it's tithing or something else. There's a faith action that you could take right now to move into that third perspective of, I'm going to partner with God. It's not about just me anymore. It's not, I'm on my own. And I'm not going to be like, God, why are you doing this? I'm going to partner with God to make it through. What is God leading you today? Will you listen? Will you obey? Will you partner with God in the way that God is nudging you towards? In the end, here's the best advice for a time of crisis, or really any other. Become a friend to God. In Jesus Christ, God is already a friend to us. Let's pray. Lord, it's easy for us to feel like we're alone in things, even when we believe in you. We, we can just feel the responsibility or the burden or things can be overwhelming. And sometimes, God, it feels like we, 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 we want answers and, and we do believe in you and, and we kind of get mad at you and we think, what, why are you doing this or why can't you keep me from this? Lord, help us to understand that the world is broken. Sometimes we face consequences of our own actions. Sometimes we live in a world where other people are just mean and awful and they're awfulness affects us, and, and sometimes things just go wrong. Sometimes our bodies, as great as they work, are frail, and sometimes things go wrong with it too. Help us to see you as the Savior that you, that you are, to reach out to you in times of crisis and other times, to partner with you. Lord, speak to us today what faith action it needs to be, and help us to respond. Help us to move towards it. Not out of fear, but out of gratefulness, out of expectation. That from here, because of this, I'm going to do this. This is my faith action. And from now on, whether in crisis or not, life's going to be different. In Jesus' name, amen.